Well, welcome to Interview with the Gunmaker. Um, and the second in the Vintage Gun Journal series of interviews with important people from the gun trade in the UK. I'm Diggory Hado, and our guest today is a man who's worked all over the gun trade in some very elevated positions and had a very interesting time during um, the, the, the long distant past for people of my age. But um, John's experience goes right through the gun trade and he's been nominated by, um, by Mark Newton and several other people I spoke to as somebody that we really need to talk to. So I'm sure viewers will find John's story fascinating and his insights into the modern gun trade enlightening. So please welcome to Interview with the Gunmaker, John Ormiston. John, welcome. Hello, hi. Thank you for joining us. So, uh, John, where were you born? I, uh, I was born in New York, in England. New York? No, in York. Ah, <laughs> I see. And, um, and what was your childhood like? What kind of boy was John Ormiston as a youngster? Well, I was always interested in um, hunting. I remember even when I was at school, before I was allowed guns, I used to make bows and arrows and try to go and shoot magpies with them. Uh, I was never ever successful with my bow and arrow. <laughs> but of course, like most people, eventually then uh, got into air rifles, which were pretty useless as well. But I went and I helped on a farm in North Yorkshire, which was owned by a friend of my father's. And he took pity on me and uh, lent me his double barreled uh, hammer gun, which, was by, which is by west of Retford. And uh, I ended up, first of all, shooting sitting rabbits with it, and then went on to um, uh, rabbits that were actually running. <laughs> Uh, sort of uh, this was going and I went to school in York as well um, as a sort of day boarder. Uh, I used to go out shooting rabbits with a muzzle loader in the mornings before I went to school uh, and then went, cycled into school rather like a French onion seller with the rabbits uh, hanging on my handlebars. And I uh, called at the butcher's shop and sold the rabbits on the way into school. And after school on the way home, I called at Bulmer's selling service in York, who dealt in guns and guitars and things like that. But they always had a box of cartridges open and they would sell you anything from one cartridge to 25. So I would often buy, say, seven or eight cartridges enough to go out shooting the next morning. And when was this, John? What, what year are we talking? Uh, well, I suppose um, I was born in 1944. So if, say, this was all happening when I was about 15, that would be 1959. I see. And what did your parents do? What was, what was your background? My mother was a teacher and my father was the chief civil engineer on British Rail for the eastern region of British Rail. And did your family support you in your interest in guns and shooting? Was this something that was passed down to you from relatives and friends? No, my father was, if anything, a bit against it. Uh, but my grandfather, who had been a station master in the North Yorkshire Moors, I think he'd done a fair bit of shooting. So. Um, my father eventually relented and uh, uh, didn't oppose, oppose it. Although when I was at school, a friend and I basically had some guns that nobody knew about. We used to go off shooting uh, when we ought to have been playing rugby. Um, and we, we also had ferrets at that time and did a lot of ferreting, both for rats and rabbits. So um, tell me, John, how did you first get into the gun trade? Was it, did you go into that as your first career or was there a, a different route for you? Uh, no, I um, uh, suppose I got into it because I took a degree in agriculture at um, Leeds University. 
then I got into estate management and I got my first job in Inverness. Then through various things, I was a red deer stalker for a couple of years, but then I started a sporting agency. Uh, and then after a few years of the sporting agency, um, I opened a gun shop in Inverness. And so that was the start of being in the gun trade. But I'd been collecting guns since I was about nine. I started off with a pinfire Le Fascio pistol that belonged to my um, great grandfather, who was a ship's captain. And the family, le uh, the family story was that he'd shot a mutineer with it on one occasion. He um, had a sailing ship that sailed from Sunderland to Rio de Janeiro. Um, and I think he brought back that fertilizer they used in those days, guano, which was um, basically seabird droppings. Do you still have it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I still have the uh, double barreled hammer gun that my father's friend lent me, the west of Retford. Uh, when he retired from farming, uh, he gave me the gun. And um, it's one of those guns I would never sell, of course. So, having opened your own gun shop, um, sorry, having opened your own gun shop, uh, did you open it with start with the collection that you'd built up, or did you start out selling modern guns from the beginning? No, no, selling modern guns because the collection that, that I built up was all based on basically British sporting weapons from flintlock up to um, you know the 1930s. So, um, yeah, no, we started off, you know, with the usual selection of Berettas and Manlickers, Steyer Manlickers and uh, Brownings and everything that the shooting community in the Highlands was needing for the, both for the estates and for the sportsmen, yeah. And how long did you stay operating from Inverness as a gun dealer before you moved away? Well, I, um, I can't remember exactly how many years, but probably about uh, 30, year, 30 years, 25, 30. But the sporting agency, you see, I eventually sold to Holland and Holland. Um, and then I became a director of Holland and Holland, and I ran their sporting agency, which incorporated the sporting agency that I had had, which was Sport in Scotland Limited. I also had started publishing two magazines, the Scottish Sporting Gazette and the African Sporting Gazette. And I, Holland and Holland, when they bought my agency, weren't interested in buying my gun shop or the magazines. But I eventually sold the magazines. And then while I was still with Holland and Holland, I actually sold the gun shop as well because Holland and Holland eventually gave me the job of uh, running the gun, the, well, both the shooting ground at Holland and Holland and the gun factory. And, and um, you make that transition it, from being a gun dealer to going into one of London's best known and longest established uh, gun makers and take control of their gun making operations. Yeah, well, I always felt a bit of an imposter somehow. I used to, uh, think when I was when I was in my teens and I went to London I used to look in Holland Holland's window but not dare to go in so actually being in there as a director made me feel a bit uh, like pinching myself and thinking how did I get here <laughs> and presumably you were surrounded by some uh, fairly inspiring and, uh, and useful figures at that point I mean you weren't a young man then but um, tell me a little bit about the people that you worked with that helped you to do your job and to create um, the sorts of guns that Holland and Holland were building at the time. Yeah, well, one person I should say who helped me a great deal because he became a, a friend through coming shooting with us was Paul Roberts, who at the time uh, owned his own shop and then owned Rigby's. And he really introduced me to the London gun trade. Um, but I also went to, um, I actually went to exhibit for my own sporting agency and for the magazines 
at Safari Club. And I think I went to Safari Club every year for 37 years. So I met quite a lot of the other exhibitors. And um, I suppose uh, meeting Alain Drash, who at the time was the chairman of Holland and Holland, and who was um, a direct appointee of the two gentlemen who owned Holland and Holland. Um, I think I met him for a couple of years at Safari Club. And I think that's really why, um, in the end, we were able to do a deal and he bought the sporting agency. So um, Paul, Paul Roberts uh, was very instrumental in introducing me to the gun trade in London. And what year was it that you, that you became uh, the man in charge of gun production at Holland and Holland? What sort of period are we talking about now? Uh, round about um, 1996, I would think. Yeah. And what sort of projects was the company taking on at the time? Can you remember any notable guns or series of guns? Or, or yeah, well, some quite interesting ones, really. We're obviously making all the normal things. But on one occasion at Safari Club, one of our best American customers came to me and said um, he wanted to, he wanted me to make him a pair of hammer guns. And I wasn't keen on doing hammer guns because I thought nobody really makes them nowadays look as good as they did in the 1870s, 1880s. And so I said, would he settle for a three-barreled gun? Um, because I had a friend who had a pair of um, Dixon three-barreled 20 bores with three triggers. And um, I thought I could, we could make him one of those, but probably make him it with one trigger. Because with the three triggers on those 20 bore Dixons, with the barrels all in a line, um, it, when you had three triggers, it was like playing a harp. You sort of, you had to tinkle your fingers along these little triggers. So we started to make him, and I said, I can't tell you what it's gonna cost, and I can't tell you when we'll get it finished. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, uh, I'll give you, I think he gave us something like, at that time, a 20,000 pound deposit to start it. <laughs> and um, anyway, it was still being made when I actually left Holland and Holland, but I know he did get it, and it, they may have made him a pair, I think. Um, the other thing that when I was there, we started remaking the Dominions, and we started remaking the Paradox uh, guns, and we actually made some Dominions with Damascus barrels as well. Where did you get the Damascus tubes from? Because I know one or two people have been making um, new guns with Damascus barrels. Oh, this is we got them shorter and shorter. Yeah, Peter found them in Liège in a cellar. And um, in fact, I've also just recently been using his Damascus tubes to re-sleeve Damascus guns. And we've just done actually a pair of uh, Stephen Grant side lever hammer guns for a customer uh, where we've sleeved, sleeved the Damascus barrels with Damascus tubes. And how has that worked as a project? Has it come out the way you'd hoped? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Of course, you do see a change in the Damascus between the chamber and the tubes because. Um, no two Damascuses are the same. But in a way, that's quite good because it allows the new owner to um, be able to demonstrate what's happened. If you couldn't see any change, I suppose, you know, it would be just like having new Damascus barrels, I suppose. Yeah, and you've treated it in exactly the same way that you would if you were sleeving with steel. You haven't had to alter the process in any way. Yeah, you have to. You have to um, get the uh, tubes into the right profile for the gun. But then you just uh, basically follow the same procedures. I don't know the procedures for, for um, sleeving in detail. Of, um, I leave that to the, the gun maker experts. Uh, I, I know what I want and I normally know 
the guy who can do it for me, but I don't get involved in the technicalities of how they do it. <laughs> if you could think of the, the single most satisfying project that you've worked on in terms of constructing a gun from design to completion, um, or a particular model that you've been in charge of reintroducing, what would it be and why? Well, I think probably, um, I, I rather like the fact that we made the um, paradoxes again on the Dominion action, because um, I myself uh, have used Holland and Holland Dominion guns for the last 30 or 40 years. Well, at, at least 40 years. In fact, probably actually from, I think my first one was 50 years ago. So I love it as a, as a type of gun. I also like Colonel Fosbury's paradox, and I used to have some very nice uh, ten bore paradoxes in my collection, um, ham a hammer one and a hammerless one, and I still have a twelve bore hammer paradox in my collection. So I felt it was a, 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 along with Russell Wilkin, we developed this um, new paradox and um, uh, sold quite a lot of them. I don't know how many they've produced and sold now, but uh, they were very popular because around the world there are people who use Holland Holland guns, of course, but there are some big collectors as well. So if you actually come out with a new or a re-issued re model, of course, they all want one. So uh, uh, they maybe don't get fad all that often, but um, uh, you know, they're equally as effective as the old ones used to be. Well, that was quite an ambitious um, project to put together. Was it something that you did based on your intuition or had you got people coming to you at that stage saying, can Holland and Holland build some more paradoxes for us, please? No, I think we, I can't really remember, but I think uh, basically, luckily, the owners were sort of into us doing interesting things and um you know it was just a good interesting thing to do and i suppose because i was interested in dominions and of course the dominion has a rather rounded action anyway and um 20 or 30 years ago round actions were all the rage everybody wanted everything with a round action so um uh, it was seemed to be just a natural it was a thing that didn't take a lot of um you had nothing to reinvent you know it was only well i suppose cutting cutting the one and a half inches of paradox rifling was the only bit that you had to uh, remember how to do sort of thing and what about the ammunition was there still enough residual knowledge in the trade at the time to be able to produce and regulate ammunition for the um yeah i think uh Kynoch were pretty good um at doing it for us. I don't exactly remember now who who we did get to make it, but I think David Little was helping us quite a lot on that. And you've worked, so you mentioned a few people already, but you've worked with some of the, uh, you know, really the foremost gun makers of, of, of their generation. Who stands out for you over the years as people who, who you really rate as gun makers and why? Well, Unfortunately, my memory for names is quite bad. At the time, though, uh, um, Peter Boxall was the factory manager. And, of course, he had a range of skills, not in actually making the guns, uh, but in, um, uh, you know, organising the whole thing. And he was very good with computers and, uh, you know, computer-driven machinery. Um, in terms of the people who are actually working for at that time, us at that time, I can't remember. But if I could just sort of change the emphasis a bit, um, yeah. as for my own um, uh, business and my own collecting, I've now been working with one gun maker in Birmingham for um, probably. 50 years, yeah, I think for 50 years. And that's Malcolm Cruxton. Yep. Many people don't know of Malcolm, but he's a very all-round gunsmith. Uh, his particular skill is in stocking, and he, he's a marvellous stocker. 
uh, but he can do a lot of the other processes as well. And of course, in Birmingham has colleagues who can do things like sleeving and blacking and all those things. So he, I mean, I talk to him probably on average once a week about various projects because even though I'm now semi-retired, I still do some projects in renovating guns for myself and I also um, get repairs done for other people and um, renovations for customers who I still have, particularly in America. But Malcolm has been a great ally and he's nearly ready for retiring. And I'm just hoping he carries on long enough so that he'll still work for me uh, up to when I decide to finally pack it in. All the old gun makers I know swear they'll never retire. They'll be, Dave Mitchell always jokes that he'll call in at the proof house on his way to the grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I spoke to Mal, the last time I spoke to Malcolm was two days ago, and he was just off to the proof house with three, three double eight bores that he was getting reproved for some, some other customer, not for me. But he at the moment is working on a fairly big, he worked on the project of uh, re-sleeving the Stephen Grant hammer guns in Damascus. And they, need, they, they were basically a pair that were in such bad condition that an American friend of mine bought them out of Holtz. And they basically needed complete rebuilding. And uh, we even had to re-engrave them all. Dave Tallett did that for me. And, um, uh, but the result was very, very good. And I actually, last um, November, I used one of the guns on a shoot in Scotland just to say that I'd shot it. And um, uh, so, um, yeah, so, we, and Malcolm is working on a pair of pretty old Woodwards as well for the same customer and sort of basically bringing the, these woodward back, Woodwards back from near death. <laughs> uh, but uh, they're, they're looking very good. And the customer used them actually um, in Scotland last autumn. Yeah. How has the gun trade changed over the last 20 or 30 years, do you think? If you think about youngsters coming into it now to do apprenticeships, um, do you think um, it requires the same sort of people coming into it and what sort of differences will they notice in their gun making lives compared with the chaps that were working at the bench when you were in charge of Collins? Well, I mean, I think at the top end, you know, the Hollands, Purdy's, Wesley Richards, um, it seems that the demand for their guns is still good from the very rich people. Um, and, you know, it seems that people are willing to spend quarter of a million pounds on a pair of guns, which to we normal people seems hardly credible that anybody could spend that much money. Um, I think at the more normal levels, um, it's a fairly um, difficult furrow to plow um, because basically the, the the amount of shooting that's going on probably is diminishing. And of course, the product that we make is um, almost indestructible. Most things nowadays, you know, um, get out of date or, or break down within four or five years of you buying them. Whereas guns just go on forever. And of course, the technology really hasn't changed much in the last 100 years or the last 120 years. And so the, 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 the supply is, is huge, the potential supply. And I think, so I think selling guns, unless it's something rare and something very high quality, um, there isn't much margin in it. And um, I must say, I have advised at least two friends I know younger than me not to open their own gun shop. And neither of them have done, but they were quite keen to do it. But I advised them not to, and basically to do 
it online and one of them in particular seems to have made a very good success of basically selling from home uh, but having a good website yeah and um, there's certainly very weak margins in, in a lot of new guns i understand that and uh, you really need to be selling in bulk to be able to make a good living out of it um, how do you see the um the market for older british guns the stuff that you really enjoy um you know you've been dealing in those sorts of things for a very long time now how has the market changed in terms of demand and are we starting to see some of the stuff that's been taken away and squirreled off in collections for years come back and do you think we've got a, a younger generation coming through that will will pick up where the Ron Holdens and people like that you know did such sterling work in driving collect, collecting and enthusiasm in the past? Yeah well I think um, that's the biggest worry because um, uh, I find that um, the average age of the people I'm dealing with is probably, you know, between 60 and 70. And um, there are, uh, certainly from where I'm viewing it, there aren't enough young people coming into it and not enough young people with money to invest into it. Um, and of course, uh, the licensing and the restrictions the police put on don't get any easier all the time. Um, so, um, and even on the antique side, I mean, if you go to antique gun shows, uh, again, the average age of the visitor to the gun show is probably, you know, round about 60. Um, and I just don't see enough young people coming in who seem to be interested in them. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's a big worry, really. Um, and if people's collections, like Bob Lee's collection, or there was the Peterson collection, which I think is being sold in America at the moment, following his death several years ago, some of these big collections come on the market. Um, I can't really see where the money will be to buy them all. Um, but there again, the auctioneers, in, um, particularly in America, is some of the big auctions, um, uh, they still seem to manage to get marvellous guns and get big prices for them when they sell them. It's so, true. Uh, the American auctions in particular, and I have to say the American dealers have, have always seem to have a phenomenal stock of extremely good quality, high condition guns, rifles that come through. And the prices that they ask, and some of the prices that are achieved seem to be you know, phenomenal. Um, whereas anything a little bit ordinary seems to do a lot worse. But you've, you're talking of prominence, you've been involved with one or two notable guns. And I, I wonder if you could cast your mind back to Dennis Finch Hatton and tell us a little bit about that adventure. Yeah, well, that was an interesting one. Um, uh, some people will know the story, but um, basically I bought a leather rifle case in Bonham's auction, which had DFH on it, on the outside, oh, and it was a, a case for a Lancaster rifle. So I bought, I bought it, I think I paid about £250 for it. I was absolutely delighted with it because I thought this has to be Danish Finch Hatton's rifle case. Um, however, I never, never dreamt that I would ever find the rifle for it because, you know, he died in his plane crash. And for all that one knew, he had the rifle in the plane. Or you would have thought because of all the sort of comings and goings in Kenya over the years that the rifle might have been confiscated by the government or the police or lost or whatever. Anyway, Holtz, three years after I got the case, Holtz um, came up with double-barreled Lancaster rifle belonging to Dennis Finch Hatton, uh, not in a case, well, it was in a sort of uh, very tatty Rigby case. 
So I rang him, of course, and got all the dimensions of it, of the rifle. And it was obviously the rifle for the case. And I think Holtz estimated it at something like uh, either three to five thousand or five to seven thousand um, pounds, uh, which I, I thought it's sure to make more than that. Anyway, I was really dedicated to um, getting it because I'd just got the top job at Holland and Holland's, and so I was had a bit more money than usual. And um, so I went to the Holtz auction and I bought it, I think it was for £27,000. And it was one of those auctions where everything goes quiet. There was somebody bidding on the phone against me and at about £24,000 I could feel the sweat breaking out on my top lip. <laughs> anyway. I remember. <laughs> were you there? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and anyway, I got it for £27,000. And then, uh, while I was still in the room, Chris Beaumont, um, who's Nick Holt's number two, came and whispered in my ear, do you want to know who was bidding against you? And I said, uh, yeah, of course I do. He said it was a lady who was trying to buy it for her husband's Christmas present. I think it was a November auction. This her husband had said, "My God, how marvelous to own a rifle like that!" So she'd got on the phone and tried to buy it. So I had to outbid her. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, and who was that? Following following that, I actually took the rifle shooting quite a lot. I took it to Africa a few times, uh, and also. Um, I actually shot wild boar in France with it. It's a bit, a bit over the top, but uh, it was very effective on boar. I'm sure it was. Um, what kind of shooting do you enjoy most, John, these days? Well, these days, I mean, I am actually restricted to driven shooting because I have a muscular condition which makes it difficult to walk and climb. I can, I'm still getting around, but, Basically, I can't walk very far, so I have to do driven shooting. And of course, when I can get it and afford it, driven grouse shootings uh, probably my well, not probably is my favourite. Um, over the years, though, the things I really loved were uh, shooting grouse over dogs, and particularly I had several Labradors which I trained to point. And so it was like a fast form of pointing because I could tell when the Labrador had smelt grouse and I could get them to walk beside me and just lead me to where the grouse were. And that was pretty exciting uh, stuff. And then, of course, I always enjoyed um, red deer stalking in Scotland, which I did quite a lot of and did it professionally for a few years. And then when we had the sporting agency, we used to take deer forests and then I and my colleague uh, sometimes did the actual stalking. So I, I really enjoyed stalking red deer, which I did, I have to say, with a 1960s BSA Hunter uh, 7x57 rifle for my entire career. Uh, and it was an absolutely cracking rifle, which I still have. Um, and with that, BSA seven millimeter. I shot everything from uh, Scottish deer to black bear to dal sheep to eland and a lot of African species. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, seven by fifty-seven is a great caliber, and it's what I shoot as well. I have a I have a, an old uh, TT Proctor uh, custom rifle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They well. always group very well. The seven by fifty-seven. Um, we found at our British Deer Society shoots in Inverness, the prize for the best group always went to a 7 by 57 No, they're very good. But I, I do know, I have noticed that you had one or two exploits up on the hill with um, rather more interesting and older rifles um, from time to time. You wrote a story for us a few issues ago about a purdy that you gave a 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I have this uh, Purdy, uh, I can't remember, it's 400 or 450 rifle, uh, which came off a local estate uh, near Inverness. I got it nearly 45 years ago. I bought it from an old keeper and it had belonged to the second Lord Tweedmouth. Um, and their interesting thing was that they invented golden retrievers. They were the first to breed golden retrievers. Um, anyway, they had this rifle. It's quite an interesting one because it's a Purdy rifle, but it's got uh, Fraser barrels on it, which must have been done in period. So, and I think the Purdy rifle would have had Damascus barrels originally, but uh, it's got a pair of typical Fraser barrels with the rib stopping a little bit short of the muzzle, you know, in very Fraser style. Anyway, we set up, I knew the owner of the estate that the rifle had been on. And so we set up a day's um, Edwardian stalking with people wearing kilts with a pony uh, to bring the stag back. Uh, David Little at Kynock loaded me ammo for the rifle, with the, uh, which was a light nitro load, but with a pinch of um, black powder in it to make it smoky. Uh, and we had a, another chap out with us who had to do a deer hounds just to give it the right effect. And uh, we managed to shoot a stag. Oh, and the owner of the the owner of the estate actually used the rifle and shot a stag. And then we did an article about it uh, in the Scottish Sporting Gazette. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic, and people can read that article on the Vintage Gun Journal if they do a quick search for it. Uh, we've, we've, oh, we've, good. Yeah, yeah, I know you you put it on. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So in, other in, interesting. Can I mention one set of other interesting guns I had? Um, I had uh, Henry Morton Stanley's revolver and his Winchester rifles that he had uh, when he went on both the Livingston expedition and on his exploration of going down the um, Congo River, and they were amazing guns to have for a while. Yeah. Stanley's exploits are probably as, as interesting and exciting and unbelievable as any Victorian explorer. I mean, his life was, was unbelievable what he managed to do. Yeah. The number of dead bodies he left behind him in terms of people that would go along on his expeditions, young, strong, virile army officers, and back would come Stanley, and very few of his companions made it. Yeah, I mean, Stanley should have died thousands of times, but he um, he, he seemed to be completely um, uh, able to overcome disease and famine and disasters and came out. I mean, he ended up as a British MP That's and right. he ended up dying in his bed somewhere in Surrey. Yeah, yeah remarkable. Yeah. John, what, um, what guns put as part of your collections that you've had in the past? Is there anything that you've, you've owned and sold and wished you'd kept? Well, of course, I wish I kept everything. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I've had some lovely guns. I had a, a four-ball Lancaster tube lock gun in its original case in new condition. And I had a pair of... Lancaster percussion rifles, which I actually bought at the Las Vegas Antique Gun Show years and years ago. And they were a pair of 12 bore rifles with all their equipment and they were brand new. They'd never been fired. Um, but unfortunately over the years, I've sort of, I've managed to luckily keep quite a decent collection, but um, I've always had other expenses that I needed to sell something. Uh, one of my expenses being a rather expensive vintage Bentley at one time. So uh, uh, it's, although I have to go on the uh, principle that it's better to have loved and lost than never have loved at all. So at least I've had these things and uh, they yeah. prove to be very good investments. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I think can't. that's right. I think the, the lot of the gun, the antique gun dealer is that, you get to touch this stuff and use it and fire it and then you pass it on and something else comes along. So rather than being something that you 
you see it as something that you own. It's so very much something that you, um, you, 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 you become acquainted with and get to know and then, um, and then pass it on to somebody else. I, I often yeah. said that if we kept everything we wanted to, we'd have fantastic gun collections, but we'd be living in a cardboard box under a bridge. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. With, with no wife and no friends, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, yeah. this has been very, very interesting, so thank you for doing it. Now, what figure in the gun trade do you think we should interview next, and why? Uh, oh, um, oh no. Um, well, of course, I don't know. Uh, who have you done up to, interviewed up to now? Well, Mark Newton was our first. You're our second. Um, yeah, I, have, well, I would say Paul Roberts. Yeah, yeah Paul Roberts is uh, definitely one I'm going to approach. Uh, Mark Newton also suggested him. Um, and, of course, Paul, yeah. very old school. I mean, Paul, Paul's knowledge is unbelievable. And um, he, of course, did a lot of uh, work in India and knew several of the Maharajas, you know, in the days when all those guns were coming out of India. So, I mean, Paul could talk to you for hours on with his stories, I'm sure. Well, John, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure viewers will find this a fascinating insight into a, an interesting life at the heart of the gun trade. So thank you for- Thank you.